let's begin. Those of you that have had a chance to stand in close proximity to me might have noticed I'm wearing cologne today, which is not my typical mode of operation. We were loading pigs this morning because the fair weigh-in is right after church, so I had an opportunity to slide over top of a pig, so I went and asked Heather, you know, if I smell okay, and she said, well, here, you smell fine, but why don't you put some cologne on? <laughs> So I'm not sure what that means, <laughs> but it occurred to me that it relates to what we're talking about today because I don't have the righteousness of the shower, as it were. I have the, my own righteousness that I put on, and that's what a little bit we're talking about today. Romans 1, 16 and 17. And it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And what we want to do today is talk about a couple key elements in those two verses, which would be the gospel of Christ, the power of God unto salvation, and the fact that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel of Christ, and it's revealed by faith. And then maybe draw a little bit of practical application from that. And one other note that I would make is that this is kind of a, there's only two verses here, but there's a lot here. You could talk for a long, long time, I think, on the topics that are in these verses. So this is a big picture, and I would commend the rest of it for your further study. Let's take a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to come together as fellow saints who understand and rejoice in your word rightly divided and the precious truth that we have in the gospel of Christ. We thank you that your word is effect effective in us and that it equips us unto every good work. We pray for our time here together. In Christ's name. So the very first thing that Paul says is, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He's not ashamed. And I looked at Galatians 6.14. You don't have to turn there because I have it up here. It says that he, he actually is, he glories in it. He's, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. And we'll talk a little bit about the contrast between man's wisdom and God's wisdom. And it's good to know that the thing that we have is something that is the power of God at work in our lives and that we can glory in that. So the, the second topic that we see here is says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Well, what is this gospel of Christ? We can point out a couple things about it. It's unique from other gospels. If we read just a bit further ahead, uh, behind us here in the book of Romans in verse 1 through 4, it tells us about another gospel. And that says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So there's a couple things we would note here. One is it was prophesied or promised before by his prophets. And then it was um, another thing to notice about the gospel of God is it was taught by Peter also. And if we look at 1 Peter 1, 4 to 17, Peter makes a reference here to the gospel of God. Peter says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin with at us, what shall the end of it be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Another thing about the gospel of Christ in, 
or the idea that it's unique from other Gospels is it does not contain information that's unique to the Gospel of Christ. We just read in Romans 1, 1 through 4 what the Gospel of God contained, and it's that Jesus Christ was the seed of David and he was the Son of God. But there's information that we'll see that's in the Gospel of Christ that is not in um, other Gospels. A second thing to note about the Gospel of Christ is it was revealed to Paul by Christ. Turn with me to Galatians 1, 11 through 12.
Romans 5.10, Paul says, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we should be saved by his life. So there's quite a difference there in messages. In one case, Peter is accusing the Israelites of crucifying with wicked hands the Messiah, and here Paul is explaining that it's uh, the death of Christ that reconciled us to God. And then 2 Corinthians 5, 19, it's a similar passage. And it says to it that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So again, referring to that uh, Christ's work on the cross was the method to reconcile us to God. Another component of the gospel of Christ is that there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. And if we go back to our, kind of our topic, Verse, Romans 1, 16 and 17, it tells us that it's to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And we can get a little more understanding of what Paul means by that if we look just a little bit earlier in that same chapter, chapter 1, verse 13. Paul's writing to the churches at Rome. And he says, Now I would not have you ignorant, brother, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you, but was thus, but was prevented thus far, that I might have some fruit among you, also even as among other Gentiles. So it'd be clear that there was Gentiles in the Roman Church. And if we go just a little deeper into the Book of Romans, Romans ten, twelve, we can see that Paul is talking about Jew and Gentile again, and he says, "For there is no difference between the Jew and the." For the same Lord over all is rich under all that call upon him. So is the question then is, is this new and unique? And the answer I would think is yes it is. And what Paul is, is saying is that there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. He's, but in verses uh, 16 he says to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I think that's just a, an acknowledgement that historically it's factual that the Jew has been first to receive information, but he's not saying that there's a difference today between Jew and Gentile. That's clear. Okay, so let's see if this is new and unique. Look at Matthew 15, 24. I'm not going to find that in Jeremiah. I'm thinking. Matthew 15, 24, Jesus speaking to the Seraphonician woman said, But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And we can look at other verses that would indicate that same thing, but these are two that we can just compare and contrast. And then look at Romans 15, 8. Romans 15, 8. Paul speaking here says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So it makes pretty clear that Christ's earthly ministry was to the Israelites and it was to confirm the promises made to the fathers. This would be part of the prophetic program. But we can contrast this with Ephesians 3.6. in Christ by the gospel. So now we know through Paul that there is no distinction. So it is new and unique, this piece of the gospel of Christ. Another feature of the gospel of Christ is that it appears only in Paul's epistles. And here it might be instructive to consider what an, the word apostle means. 
What does the word apostle mean? Teacher? Okay. It means one sent or messenger. Look at um, John 13, 16. Jesus is speaking here. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. And the word is sent is the Greek word that's most often translated apostle. It's also translated messenger, messengers a couple times. Once in Philippians, I think. So, if you, so we can see that just illustrates that the word apostle would mean one sent. And then if we drop down to verse 20, you kind of get a flavor of what's going on here. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomever I send, receiveth me, and he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. So there's an issue of the message. You're, a, you're an apostle because you have a message. And if people receive the message, then they're receiving the person that sent the messenger. We can look also at Philippians 2, 25, and see another instance of this. And Paul says, Yet I thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, there's the word messenger, and he that ministereth to my need. And if we look at 4.18, Paul says, But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an order of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, while pleasing to God. So it's, it's interesting to note again that there's a couple things that are kind of pointed out here. One is that the, an apostle is one that is sent and they have a message. And then the, the thing being sent is the issue, and that appears to be the issue here with Paul. He points out the thing that was sent by Epaphroditus. So the question then would be, why did God select Paul as an additional apostle? We have already 12 apostles, or other, and beyond that there's other apostles. So why did we need another apostle? If you turn to Ephesians 3, 6 to 8, you already were there a second ago. Again, Paul says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, when less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So Paul was an apostle because he had a unique message. And that's why we find the gospel of Christ only appearing in Paul's epistles. Because that was his message. And we can look at Galatians 2, 8 and see that just one of many indications that Paul and other apostles did not teach the same information. So in other words, that this gospel of Christ is unique from other gospels. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. So that's just some comments about the gospel of Christ. Going back to our main text, Romans 1, 16 to 17, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So let's look at that phrase. Turn with me back to Corinthians 1, 18. We've been there a moment ago when we were talking about the preaching of the cross. But there's something else to point out here. Paul says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved it is the power of God. So here again we have that idea that the gospel of Christ contains or is the power of God. That word. And then if we 
drop down just to verse 23 and 24, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Gentiles foolishness, but unto them who are called, both Jew and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So does that make any difference? 1 Corinthians 2, 2-5. This power of God and the, the fact that that's at work in, a, in the salvation that's through the gospel of Christ. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So do we as human beings sometimes get enamored with the wisdom of men? We grab a book, we read it, like, wow, that's great, that's amazing. And then the next day we come home from work and say, honey, you'll never believe what they made me do at work or what situation is going on. Frustrated with people because they're people. So my point is, is that it's good to know that our faith is not in the wisdom of men. It's in the power of God. And that cannot be shaken because the, the wisdom of men is not going to be sufficient. So that, I would say, we talked about just a little bit of practical application. That is a practical application. I think the doctrine there is the practical. And then 2 Timothy 1.18, just a little bit along these lines. Paul speaking to Timothy. And as you are well aware, there's some... Not very good things going on in Paul's life and in the ministry. And he's talking to Timothy, trying to encourage him. Because I think Timothy had become a little discouraged or maybe uh, timid. But be not therefore, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor be his prisoner, but be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Again, good to know that in the gospel there's, we're going to face affliction, but we have the power of God that our faith is in. So in the next thing, it's in our text verse, it says the righteousness of God is revealed. So, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. And I thought it would be good to look at the word righteousness just briefly and get a flavor of, of what that means. These are definitions from Webster's 1828 Dictionary, courtesy of the World Wide Web. It says, purity of heart and rectitude of life, conformity of heart and life to the divine law. The second definition is, in, as applied to God, the perfection or holiness of his nature. And then the third definition is the accurate and passive obedience of Christ by which the law is fulfilled. Simply put, righteousness is just rightness. It's being right. A related word is justification. And this is showing to be just or conformable to law, rectitude or propriety. The second definition would be in law, the showing of a sufficient reason in court why a defendant did what he is called to answer. And then in theology, remission of sins and absolution from guilt and punishment. And I think for the purpose of our discussion, those are, can be used. So then the question is, how is man righteous or how is man made righteous? Turn with me to Job. This one I know we should have marked here. Job 8.20. This is Bildad, the so-called miserable comforter, talking to Job. And he says, in verse 20, Behold, God will not cast away a perfect man, neither will he help the evildoers. And then if you drop down to verse 1 of chapter 9, Then Job answered and said, I know it is of a truth. But how should man be just before God? And that's the question we have here. How should man be 
just and righteous. If he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a, hundred, of a thousand. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who has hardened himself against him and who has prospered. He it is who removed the mountains and they know not, who overcometh them in his anger, who taketh the earth, who shaketh the earth out of its place and the pillars of it tremble. So a picture of God and his power and authority and then the question of how a man be made righteous. Look at Romans 10, 1 through 3, and this is the reference I made a little earlier to spraying cologne on myself to put on my own righteousness. Romans 10, 1 to 3. Paul speaking here about Israel says, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer for, uh, to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And then if you flip with me to Philippians 3, 4 to 9. in the flesh, if any man, any other man thinketh that he hath reason for which he might trust in the flesh, I am more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. So Paul, Saul, I should say rather, was blameless in the law. But Paul, the apostle, had the righteousness of God, and we'll see what that means as we go here. So then, the question is, that kind of made me wonder, when I was reading these verses in Romans, the righteousness of God is revealed. Well, how could that be? Where was it before? What happened under the law? How were people made righteous under the law? Look with me at Romans 2, 17 to 25. But if thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and maketh thy boast of God, and knoweth his will, and approveth the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that thou art thyself a guide to, of the blind, a light to, of them who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, who has the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. Thou therefore, who teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that saith a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. And he goes on to say in verse 29, But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in, in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So how does that work? Romans 3 gives us a little more information. If we go to verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the law was not, it was not possible for man to be justified by the law because we couldn't keep it. The law was to show the whole world guilty before God, and that we see in verse 19. Now we know that whatever things the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may become guilty before God. So if we have if Israel had the law and was not able to keep it, how were they to be righteous? <clears throat> Look with me at Genesis 15, 1 to 6. Things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in 
in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceedingly great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is this Eli, whoever. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own loins shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, So shall thy seed be. And here's the key verse. And he, Abram, believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And if we go back, I should have told you to keep your hand in Romans. My apologies. If we go back to Romans chapter 4, the Apostle Paul talks about this. In verse 3, But what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness apart from works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So that tells us that under the law, righteousness was obtained or given. I guess I should word it differently. Under the law, righteousness was imputed by God based on people believing God and that being coming for righteousness. So how does it work under grace? Well, if we go back to Romans 3.21, we see some key words that we're familiar with, but now. Paul says, but now. The righteousness of God apart from the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So the righteousness of God is manifest. It was in operation before, but now it's manifest. And it's witnessed by the law and the prophets. So again, the idea that it was available, you could have kept the law, but you couldn't. Romans 4 and 9. You see just another verse that shows that it's available to, that righteousness, God's righteousness, is available to us. Come at this blessedness then on the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So it comes on the circumcision and the uncircumcision, according to Paul. And if we look at Romans 5, 1, we see that we are justified by faith. So it says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the paradox of grace, I would say. We read in Job how Bill Dad said that God would um, not help an evildoer, but would reward the righteous or something to that effect. And under grace, we see God condemning the righteous and redeeming or making righteous the wicked, as it were. So when was the righteousness of God revealed? Romans says it was revealed. When was it made manifest? Let's look at some possible instances when it could have been. Matthew 23, 1-3. Was it revealed before... Jesus is saying, Then spoke Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, all therefore, whatever they did you observe, that observe and do, but do not after their works, for they say and do not. So Christ is instructing the people to keep the law still. What about after his death? Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Maybe it was revealed at that time. so-called 
Great Commission. Christ speaking to his disciples said, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So, teaching them to observe all things that I have, whatsoever I have commanded you is, again, I think a reference to the law, keeping the law. So, we don't yet have a manifestation of righteousness under grace. How about after his ascension? How about in Acts chapter 2? Maybe that's where it occurred. So here's the disciples and early believers living together and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their food with gladness and singleness of heart. They're still living in the temple. They're still observing the law. So back to Romans 3.21 Paul said, and we pointed it out, and you guys are well aware of it, the words, but now. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is manifest. So that but now references a dispensational change. God's righteousness was made manifest at this dispensational change. If we got down to verse 26, Paul reiterates that comment by saying, To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him who believeth in Jesus. How is it made manifest? Well, if we go back to Romans 1, 16 to 17, it tells us, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So it's revealed from faith to faith. What does that mean? Does that mean degrees of faith? More and more faith? That wouldn't seem to make sense in the context because right after this says the just shall live by faith. How about, I think what it means is it's the faith of Christ and our faith in it. That's how it's revealed. That's how it's made manifest. So we've said that righteousness and justification is by faith. Romans 3, 30. So this is kind of, we, we talked about under the law and under grace. And now we kind of can bring these two concepts together. Seeing it is one God who shall justify the circumcision by faith and this uncircumcision through faith. So what does that mean? So the by, the word by, so the, what did he say here? So justify the circumcision by faith. So it's by or it's out of faith by way of works. So what they did was, a, was belief in what God told them to do. And that was counted to them for righteousness. And then it says justify these circumcision, oh, excuse me, where are we? Who shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith? And through is by way of faith directly. So similar but different. Can I ask a question? Yes. I'm just curious. How did you determine by meant out of faith by way of works? Did you read that somewhere else or did you conclude that um, from your own study? Um, I think it's both. Okay. It's something that. The reason I, I, I'm not the, the reason I'm asking is because you're touching on a lot of things here that are being debated um, by certain preachers, even in the uh, Gray School of Bible Camp, regarding how Old Testament saints were justified. Um. So what you're, I'm intrigued by what you're saying here because you're just 
seemingly giving what's the obvious meaning of the verses without really doing a lot of mental gymnastics with respect to them. Um, because I've always thought there's a difference between by faith and through faith in that verse too. Um, so I was just curious how you how how you um, came to the conclusion that by is out of faith by way of works as opposed to through faith being by the way of faith directly. So do other people? What do other people say? Well, you say there's a debate. What is what is the opposite? There's some some guys, some of the brethren are are seeming, if I'm understanding them correctly, are are trying to say that justification was the same all through the Bible, and I'm I'm struggling with that because of verses like what you're bringing up here. Uh, you know, what is Romans three? If 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 people are if people in time past we're always declared righteous the same way you and I are, then what does verse 21 mean? Mm -hmm. When it says, but now the righteous of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law of the prophets. I mean, I just, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm bringing up something we don't need to talk about now, but I, I'm, I'm curious as to, when you said that up there, as well as a few other things, you, you, have, you have my interest in how you, how you came to that conclusion. The one, I did kind of struggle in my mind when I read, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is manifest. Okay, that makes sense. Because that's right in keeping with verses 16 and 17. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That almost seemed to kind of muddy the, the waters of my mind there a little bit. But I think, as I thought about it, that doesn't mean that the law and the prophets are related to the righteousness of God being revealed apart from the law. It's, it's a, that, I don't know if I can explain it that well, but it's that they're kind of looking back and saying, yes, it was available if you could have kept the law, but you couldn't. And then it seems like when I was looking at um, verse 30, I could have put other verses down, but it seemed like the by faith is pretty consistent. So, for by grace are you saved through faith? No, wait a minute. That doesn't sound consistent. <laughs> for by grace are you saved through faith. Right? Verse right. 2, 8, and 9. Right. So, that, that, yeah, that's correct. It, it seems consistent, and it seems intentional, not just a, you know, yeah, and a selection of words. So in verse 21, he says, but now, the righteousness of God, right? Then you go to verse 26, and he says, to the clear eyes say, at this time. Right. So th those seem to me to be like timing words of distinction. Right. I would say that makes sense if you just read it. And then verse 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. I struggle to see how someone before the Pauline revelation was made could have ever said in verse 28. Right. And that's what I that's what I think, that's what intrigued me when I started reading verse 16 and 17, but now the right or it doesn't say but now the right for herein is the righteousness of God revealed. And I got to wonder, well, where has it been? Yeah, revealed would make it seem as though the gospel of Christ is revealing something about the righteousness of God right. that had heretofore not been revealed, right. right? Right. And you put that with verse 21, but now the righteousness of God is manifested. What does right. manifested mean? It appears. It's, yeah, right. So it's not that it, it's not that the righteousness of God wasn't there. Right. The difference is now it's manifested right. to a to a um, Anyway, so that's why sorry I, said, I interrupted you. No, I, it's a good comment. That's why I said before that it was in operation, but it wasn't manifest. It was working, but not made manifest. Okay, so this is actually the kind of the concluding thoughts anyway. Some, just some things that are kind of 
loosely strung together that would be maybe related to what we're talking about. So, as we've just mentioned, our justification is by faith without works. That's important to know in our Christian life, I would say. And we find that in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. But works do have a role. Caleb talked about some things in Romans last week, and Brian and Mike were talking, and one comment that Brian made was throughout the first 11 chapters of Romans, we have kind of a very logical progression of information, and then chapter 12, verse 1 starts out and says, therefore, on the basis of the first 11 chapters, I command you, but it doesn't say command, I beseech you. By the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice. It's our reasonable service. So doing works isn't part of our justification, but it is a part of our Christian life. Titus 2, 7 to 14 is another reference to good works. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he is of that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. It's uh, 14. Exhorting servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not perorning, not showing, but showing good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that has bring us salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying them godliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from iniquity and purify unto himself the people of his own zealous of good works. So two things to point out there, I think, would be that we are, that God did redeem us to have a people to be zealous of good works, and that we're to behave in a particular way, so that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil thing to say of you. And I think that's part of this next point, what I'm calling, I didn't know what to call it exactly, so I call it a result of good works, a not being it's one of possibly many results. Look with me at Samuel, 2 Samuel 12, 13, and 14. Earlier we had read in Romans 2 that because of you that the word of God is blasphemy among the Gentiles, and that I think is a reference to this verse. In this instance here, where David has sinned with Bathsheba, and Nathan tells him the story of the, the two men with the goats, and he says, Thou art the man. And in verse 13, David said, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also, also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because of this deed, thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. So the point I'm making here and in Titus is simply that whether we're talking about Israel or we're talking about the church, the body of Christ, both agencies are used by God to be a light to the world. And if we don't behave like we're instructed to behave, then there's a consequence that the word of God or the name of God is blaspheming among the enemy. So that is one last verse and then we are done, and that is Titus 2, 5, and 8. Oh, that's, I pointed those out already. So, comments, questions? I have a question. Yes, sir. At the top of that slide, You've got by is out of faith by way of works, and through is by way of faith directly. But then you slide down 
in your application and you say justification is by faith without work, shouldn't that be through faith? Yes, it should. Without work, good catch. Where were you when I was typing this up? <laughs> Probably at home in bed. Oh, no. <laughs> no, that's, I, yes, I was just curious. More accurate. What would, I'm just going to, I want to, I'm curious, I'm going to ask this question as a devil's advocate type question because I just want to know what you would say about it because I was asked this question recently, okay. okay. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It, it was recently, I've heard it recently stated that the gospel of Christ is a trans-dispensational gospel based on this verse in Mark 1.1. 1, 1. Well, okay, but that's the only other place outside of Paul's epistles that that phrase, and it's not the exact phrase, occurs. So if it's a gospel that's pervasive somewhere else, then how come it's not mentioned other places? I would also say that I think the word gospel is can be just news or good news. So this is the news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in his earthly ministry on earth. There's no reference in Mark to anything that's unique about the gospel of Christ that we've already talked about. Yeah, that's basically what I probably would say too. The other thing to me is 1 Corinthians 9. Um, to read verse 17 and 18. 9, 17 and 18. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge that I abuse not my right in the gospel. Now, when I read those two verses, to me... He identifies in verse 17 that a dispensation of the gospel is committed to him. And then in verse 7, in verse uh, 18, he names or identifies what gospel that is by calling it the gospel of Christ. Right. I think that's, for me, I think that's the clearest passage that indicates that, there's a, that the gospel of Christ is a specific, at least in Paul's usage, is a specific dispensation of the gospel that, that was committed to Paul. If that's not what that means, then I don't know what the word dispensation means anymore. Right. And I would agree with your, your thought in there that he's talking about a dispensation of the gospel being committed to him. He can do it willingly or unwillingly, but he has to do it because he has a dispensation of the gospel committed to him. Yeah, he's, so he, he's different than you and I. I mean, he's, he's seen Christ in the, personally and was given something personally to do by Christ. So it's so he I mean he's sort of he doesn't have a choice really. So then I have a question for you on this by and through. So are are other people saying that how do they get around works under the law? And then in the general epistles again it's the works is is definitely there. I don't, I don't know that I can adequately answer that because I don't know that, I've, that I even fully understand what is being said other than I don't think that works saved anyone in time past just doing the work. Obviously they had to believe and they had to have faith in what they were you know what they were uh, what they were doing, but I can't, I can't see a person in time past, you know, uh, functioning by faith, saying, you know, I just really don't think I need to try to keep the law. That, that, that seems to me to be not, that's not the response of faith if you're a member of the nation of Israel living in time past, because God says, here's the law, they agree to follow the law in, in Exodus, and God's going to hold them accountable to whether or not they're doing what they said they would do. So I just I, I 
I worry to some degree that what's going on here is a propensity to want to read the present into the past too much. Because I go all through, I read through the Gospels, and it's, you know, time and time and time again, there seems to be these things that, you know, God deals, God's dealing with Israel conditionally. He's not dealing with them on the basis of, you know, grace, the way he, you know, the way he deals with us today. So, there's some stuff maybe, I don't understand maybe about what some of the guys are trying to say, but there's some other things that just seem to me to be pretty basic. And I think they're, you know, Stanton's things that differ says that they're saved by works. I don't, I don't, I, to me, I don't think their work is what saved them. I think, I think they demonstrated that they had faith by attempting to do what God was telling them to do. So it's almost like you have this situation where they're not saved by their works, but they're also sort of not saved with, without them. Well, and David, I think, is a good example. He committed a pretty heinous crime. But yet, when God talks about David, he talks about his heart. And when he's talking to Solomon, he says, your heart isn't like your father's was. So I think it's to your point that it was his heart was correct. His actions weren't always blameless. So when you get to verses in Luke, like Luke 7, where it talks about how the Pharisees... The Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized with John. So John the Baptist shows up saying, repent, be baptized, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right. And there's this whole group within Israel that's rejecting that message. And then the next verse says um, that the people that, the people that um, submitted to John's baptism justified God. Let me find the verse. Luke 7, 29, all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. So, it, I just read that, and to me, water baptism in that program at that time, specific time is not optional. You, you demonstrate you believe the message by going and doing, and the message is saying, repent, be baptized. So, I don't, I don't think a member of the nation of Israel living in time past could have said, yeah, I believe the gospel of the kingdom, but I just don't want to get wet because I'd rather be dry. Right? That, I don't. I don't see how that's. I don't know. I, I, this stuff I struggle with. Well, it's, it's certainly. And then the next verse. Sorry, verse thirty. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized in John. So that, that just seems obvious that they're rejecting something that God was requiring of them. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Oh, that's good. Okay. You may dismiss to your own recognizance.